chapter twenty of the forbidden way by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva la femme propose the wagon road to the lone tree skirted the mountains for a way and then wound through a nick in the foothills into a level vale of natural parks meadows and luxuriant grass bordered by pines and cottonwoods beneath which tiny streams meandered leisurely down to the plains below mrs cheyne emerged from the scrub oak delightedly it's like a central park for brobdingnags she cried i feel as though apache ought to have seven league horseshoes as a piece of landscape gardening it's remarkably well done for nature is so apt to make mistakes only art is unerring she breathed deep and sighed here it seems nature and art are one but it's all on such a big scale it makes me feel so tiny i'm not sure that i like it jeff ray i don't fancy being an insect and the mountain tops will they never come any nearer we've been riding toward them for an hour but they seem as far away as ever i know now why it was that i liked you because your eyes only mirrored big things nobody can have a mountain for a friend without joining the immortal fellowship it makes it so easy to scorn lesser things like bridge and teas imagine a mountain at an afternoon tea jeff rode beside her answering in monosyllables the road now climbed a wood of tall oaks rock pines and spruces through which the sunlight filtered uncertainly dappling fern and moss with vagrant amber somewhere near them a stream gushed among the rocks and a breeze crooned in the boughs rita cheyne stopped talking and listened for she knew not what there was mystery here the voice of the primeval calling to her down the ages she glanced at jeff who sat loosely on his horse his gaze on the trail she had believed he shared her own emotions but she knew by the look in his eyes that his thoughts were elsewhere she spoke so suddenly that he looked up startled why don't you say something this place makes me think about time and death the two things i most abhor come let's get out of here apache sprang forward up the trail at the bidding of his mistress whose small heels pressed his flanks again and again as she urged him on and out into the afternoon sunlight beyond while jeff thundered after he caught her at the top of a sand ridge half a mile away where they pulled their horses down to a walk what was the matter said jeff you rode as if the devil was after you oh no i'm not afraid of the devil it's the mystery of the infinite that wood why don't the dead oak branches fall they look like gibbets Ugh! she shuddered and laughed didn't you feel it feel what spooky no i camped there once when i was prospecting that stream you jumped was dead man's creek he must be there yet the dead man it was like a tomb who was he a soldier he deserted from fort garland and was killed by some mexicans they buried him under a pile of stones what a disagreeable place it's like a cemetery for dead hopes i won't go back you'll have to take me around some other way what are you afraid of i'm afraid of melancholy i hate unhappiness i was born to be amused i won't be unhappy she said almost fiercely why should i be i have everything in the world that most people want if i see anything i want and haven't got i go and get it you're lucky she shrugged so people say i do as i please i always have and always will you were surprised to see me here i told you why i came i wanted to see you you were the only person in new york who did not bore me to extinction if it gives me pleasure to be here this is the place where i ought to be that's logical isn't it it sounds all right but you won't stay here long he said why not 
you couldn't stand it there's nothing to do but ride i'd rather ride than do anything else jeff looked straight forward over his horse's ears his eyes narrowing his lips widening in a smile well if you don't see what you want ask for it he said slowly i will just now however i don't want anything except an interest in your business you're going to let me have it aren't you jeff you take some stranger in why not me i'm the most innocuous stockholder that ever lived i always do whatever anybody tells me to do you don't realize the situation i've told you i'm in a dangerous position with that stock in my possession again all my holdings would be intact and i might stand a long siege or perhaps be able to make a favorable compromise but there's no certainty of it i don't know what they've got up their sleeves as it is i stand to lose the greater part of my own money but i'm not going to lose yours i don't believe you're going to lose i'm not quite a fool those papers you showed me don't prove anything the development company has two hundred thousand acres of land worth twenty dollars an acre and the coal fields besides that's good enough security for me it would be good enough security for anyone if we had our connection i could make you a lot of money he broke off impatiently see here rita don't press me in this matter i'd rather wait a while i've got a few days before those notes are due something may turn up which will let me out thanks i'm not going to be left out i know what you've done in these mountains and in this country and i believe in you as much as i ever did i'd like you to let me help you and i'm not afraid of losing but if i do lose it won't kill me perhaps i'm richer than you think i am i'm willing to wait you'll be rich again some day and i'll take my chances they can't keep you down jeff not for long jeff thrust forward a hand and put it over hers you're solid gold rita and you're the best friend i ever had i can't say more than that she smiled happily i've been hoping you'd say that it's worth coming out here for i want to prove it though and i hope you'll let me the road now turned upward toward the railroad grade as they reached the crest of the hill jeff pointed to the left at the mills and the smelter buildings hanging tier on tier down the side of the mountain below in a depression of the hills a lake had formed surrounded by banks of reddish earth the whole scene was surpassingly ugly and the only dignity it possessed was lent by the masses of tall black stacks above which hung a pall of smoke and yellow gases rita cheyne gasped so that's the bone of contention i thought it would be something like the new york public library or the capitol at washington why jeff it's nothing but a lot of rusty iron sheds yes he drawled we don't go in much for architecture out here it's what's inside those sheds that counts we've got every known appliance for treating ore that was ever patented with a wrinkle or two the amalgamated hasn't they rowed around the lake while ray explained everything to her and then up the hill toward the trestles and ore dumps of the lone tree mine ray's struggles for a right-of-way to the markets of the country showed no reflection here from two small holes in the mountainside cars emerged at intervals upon their small tracks and dumped their loads at the mill from which there came a turmoil of titanic forces jeff offered to show his companion the workings but she refused no i think not she said it's too noisy here i haven't finished talking to you and i want to ride and so they turned their horses heads into another trail which descended among the rocks and scrub oak after a while emerging at the edge of a great sand dune which the wind had tossed up from the valley below a hill of sand a thousand feet high 
three miles wide and six miles long a mountain range in miniature in which trees rocks and part of a mountain were obliterated even the great desert had not presented to rita change such a scene of desolation their horses stopped sniffed the breeze and snorted jeff pointed into the air where some vultures wheeled mrs cheyne shuddered it looks like paradise lost we're not going there no i only wanted you to see it there's a thousand million dollars of gold in that sand pile let it stay there i think it's a frightfully unpleasant place why do you show me all these things when all i want to do is to talk she turned her horse's head and they followed a slight trail between groves of aspen trees a shimmering loveliness of transparent color you're not giving me much encouragement jeff you didn't believe in my friendship in new york but you're trying your best to keep me from proving it here i do believe it now didn't i tell you so yes but you don't show it what do you think my enemies in new york are saying of my disappearance what will they say when they know i've come out here to you not that i care at all only i think that you ought to consider it i do he said briefly why do you make such a sacrifice i never make sacrifices she said eluding him skilfully even for my friends don't make that mistake i've told you i came because i'd rather be here than in new york if i heard that your financial enemies were trying to ruin you that only made me the more anxious to come besides i had an idea that you might be lonely was i right yes i am was you mean yes was he corrected i've been pretty busy of course night as well as day but after new york this place is pretty quiet did you miss me yes frankly i did you and i seem to get on pretty well i think we always will so do i i've always wondered if i'd ever meet a man who hadn't been spoiled and i was just about ready to decide that he didn't exist when you came along the discovery restored my faith in human nature it was all the more remarkable too because you were married most married men are either smug and conceited or else dejected and apprehensive in either case they're quite useless for my purpose what is your purpose he asked psychological experiment she returned glibly some naturalists study beetles others butterflies and moths i like to study men have you got me classified yes you're my only reward for years of patient scientific endeavor the mere fact that you're married makes no difference except that as a specimen you're unique do you wonder that i don't want to lose you i'm not running away very fast no but the fact remains that you're not my property she answered frowning i can't see i've never been able to see why you ever married any more than i can see why i did i'm quite sure that you would have made me an admirable husband just as i'm sure that i would have made you an admirable wife you don't mind my speaking plainly do you i'm thinking out loud i don't do it as a rule it's a kind of luxury that one doesn't dare to indulge in often i have so many weak points in which you are strong and i have a few strong ones in which you are weak we could help each other you could make something of me i'm sure i'm not as useless as i seem to be sometimes i think i have in me the material to accomplish great things if i only knew where to begin or if i had some one who is in the habit of accomplishing them to show me how that is why i wanted to help you it struck me as a step in the right direction it was he ventured only it was too big a step one can't do big things by halves she insisted money is the only thing i have that you lack it is the only thing that i can give that's why i want to give it so that you can use it as a measure of my sincerity i'd like to make you happy too she paused and her voice sank a note why should you be unhappy you don't deserve it 
i know you don't i haven't any patience with women who don't know a good thing when they have it perhaps i'm not as good a thing as i seem you yourself are not beyond making mistakes rita oh jane i didn't make that mistake jane did he thought marriage was a sentimental holiday when everybody nowadays knows that it's only a business contract don't let's talk of chain i can still hear the melancholy wail of his cello i want to forget all of that you have helped me to do it i've been looking at you from every angle jeff ray and i find that i approve of you your wife has other views she married you out of pique you married her because she was the only woman in sight you put a halo around her head dressed her up in tinsel set her on a gilt pedestal and made believe that she was a goddess it was a pretty game but it was only a game after all imagine making a saint of a woman of this generation people did back in the dark ages but the ages must have been very dark or they'd never have made such a mistake i've often thought that saints must be very uncomfortable because they were human once your wife was human she still is she didn't want to be worshipped she hadn't forgotten my cousin cortland you see what's the use of all this rita said ray hoarsely i don't mind your knowing everybody else seems to but why talk about it let sleeping dogs lie she waved her hand in protest one of the dearest privileges of friendship is to say as many disagreeable things as one likes i'm trying to show you how impossible you are to a woman of her type and how impossible your wife is to you i'd rather you wouldn't she marries you to prove to my cousin cortland that he isn't the only man in the world and then spends an entire winter in new york proving to everybody that he is there hasn't been a day since you left that they haven't been together riding motoring going to the theatre and opera it has reached the point when people can't think of asking one of them to dinner without including the other if you don't know all this it's time you did and i take it as a melancholy privilege to be the one to tell you of it it's too bad no clever woman can allow herself to be the subject of gossip and when she does she has a motive for what she's doing or else she doesn't care perhaps you know what mrs ray's motive is if you have an understanding with her you haven't done me the honor of telling it no he muttered i'm not in the habit of talking of my affairs you know we don't get along no amount of talking will help matters what are you going to do ray's eyes were sullen rita cheyne chose to believe that he was thinking of his wife but as he didn't reply at once she repeated the question it almost seemed as though her insistence annoyed him but his tone was moderate what is it to you rita she took a quick glance at him before she replied it means a good deal to me she went on more slowly to begin with i haven't any fancy for seeing my best friend made a fool of by the enemies of his own household it seems to me that your affairs and hers have reached a point where something must be done perhaps you've already decided i've left her she's in love with court bent i have proof of it we made a mistake that's all of course you did she said i'm glad that you acknowledge it are you going back to new york i haven't decided that depends on many things she thinks i'm in love with you they had come to a piece of rough ground sown with boulders and fallen trees through which their horses picked their way carefully rita cheyne watched the broad back of her companion with a new expression in her eyes he had never seemed so difficult to read as at this moment but she thought that she understood and she found something admirable in his reticence and in his loyalty to his wife in a moment the trail widened again as they reached the levels and her horse found its way alongside his she thinks you're in love with me what does she know about love what do i know about it or you love is a condition of mind 
contagious in extreme youth but only mildly infectious later in life why should any one risk his whole future on a condition of mind you feel sick but you don't marry your doctor or your trained nurse because he helps to cure you why don't you simply because you get well and then discover that your doctor has a weak chin or disagreeable finger ends when you get well of love if you marry to cure it there's nothing left but reno i don't believe in love i simply deny its existence just as i refuse to believe in ghosts or a personal devil i resent the idea that your wife should believe you're in love with me you find pleasure in my society because i don't rub you the wrong way and i like you because i find less trouble in getting on with you than with anybody else you're a cold-blooded proposition rita said ray smiling yes if it's cold-blooded to think and to say what one thinks but i'm not so cold-blooded that i could marry one man when i liked another a man with whom i had no bond of sympathy Chane was the nearest approach i could find to the expression of a youthful ideal people told me i was in love with him so i married him of course if i'd had any sense but what's the use i've learned something since then today i would marry not for love but for something finer not because of a condition of mind or a condition of body but because of a stronger more enduring relation like that between the lime and sand that build a house i'd marry a man because i wanted to give him my friendship and because i couldn't get on without his friendship and if the house we built would not endure then no marriage will endure you mean rita ray interrupted with sober directness that you'd marry me if you could she flushed mildly i didn't say so i said i would marry for friendship because it's the biggest thing in the world i don't mind saying i'd marry you it's quite safe because obviously i can't jeff looked at her uncertainly and then laughed noisily rita you're a queer one i never know when the seriousness stops and the fun begins she smiled and frowned at the same time the fun hasn't begun i mean what i say why shouldn't a woman say what she thinks a man does i shock you no it's a part of you somehow speak out i'll tell you whether i believe you or not when you're through i suppose i'm what people call a modern woman if i am i'm glad of it most women fight hard for their independence i've simply taken mine i say and do and shall always say and do precisely what comes into my mind i've no doubt that i'll make enemies i've already succeeded in doing that i'll also probably shock my friends but i've thrown away my fetters and refused to put them on again because some silly prig believes in living up to feminine traditions i haven't any sympathy with tradition tradition has done more to hinder the enlightened development of the individual than any single force in history tradition means old fogyism cant and hypocrisy i never could see why because our fathers and mothers were stupid we have to be stupid too imagine an age in which it was not proper to cross one's legs if one wanted to an age of stiff back chairs to sit in which was to be tortured when every silly person denied himself a hundred harmless innocent amusements simply because tradition demanded it we live in an age of reason if a woman loves a man why shouldn't she tell him so End of chapter 20